Hi, Neil. Hey, Carl. Uh, so my name uh, is uh, Carl Zimmer, and I'm a science writer, uh, and I write a lot about things like uh, Neil Shubin uh, does for research. And uh, Neil, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Just tell people who you are, okay. where you are. My name is Neil Shubin. I'm a professor at uh, the University of Chicago. I also have, a, have an affiliation at the Field Museum of Natural History, where I'm provost. I'm a paleontologist. also do some developmental biology in my laboratory as well. So um, the reason that I asked Neil uh, if he'd uh, come on Blogging Heads is um, because he's got this new book out, this really uh, great book called Your Inner Fish, which I just held up to the camera, uh, which is coming out uh, January 15th, right, Neil? Yeah, a week from today. Okay, and uh, so, you know, I... I should say, first off, I've known Neil for a long time, and uh, so this is this is sort of a you know a part of a kind of an ongoing conversation with us. I think we met uh, ten years ago, maybe. Yeah, when when you started off on uh, Water's Edge. So when was that? It was ten years ago, just after we found Cerepterus. Yeah, so this was my first book uh, that I was writing. It was called At the Water's Edge, and I was really interested in big evolutionary transitions. So one example was how life came out of the water or how our ancestors came out of the water. And so Neil was one of these uh, first people to, to really aggressively push the idea that um, you could look at fossils to get some answers to that question, and you could look at embryos too, and you could look at genes, and you could kind of put all this together and integrate it into one big picture. And um, so we have... Um, we stayed in touch. I wrote about uh, Neil uh, last year in a National Geographic piece I did. And um, what's really neat is that I think Neil sort of, you're kind of an example of how science just doesn't stop. You know, it. Uh, I write a book and it just keeps going. And so, <laughs> you know, you've been finding these in incredible fossils that, that help to, to fill in the picture. Um, you know, I thought probably the best way to, to start talking about all this was just to talk about this fossil. Actually, let me hold up the book again. Um, that picture there is of a, a critter named Tectolic rosier. Is that correct? Yeah, rosier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we just talk about Tectolic first off. Let's let's talk about okay. how you found it and why that put you on the front page of the New York Times. So what got me interested in this problem? In the beginning was great evolutionary transformations, the big steps of evolution. And even as a graduate student, I was really interested in these big jumps and getting new data that tells us about how they happened. And much of that data is new fossils, but also there's a lot of data that comes from embryos and genes, as you mentioned. The paleontology piece is really rich because by discovering new fossils, we can find whole new kinds of creatures that we didn't know existed before. Um, likewise, we can learn something about their environments. And so starting, I think, like in 1993... Uh, we started working in Devonian age rocks in Pennsylvania. So, hold on. With so, Devonian is how old? So, how old are these rocks? Devonian in Pennsylvania? is about, in Pennsylvania, they're about 365 million years right. old, which is sort of at the end of the transformation from water to land. It's when you would expect to find the earliest, say, amphibians, the earliest land-living creatures. Yeah, and I should say, um, I should say that I, I, um, I mean, I've been to this, this, uh, kind of place. I, I mean, I, I went with one of your colleagues to one of these sites, and it's, um, it's funny because, I mean, I think a lot of people think these sites are really, I don't know, romantic and it's all sort of Indiana Jones or something. <laughs> no. I mean... It's totally different. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, you know, you're standing on the side of a highway in Pennsylvania. Yeah, trucks are whizzing by. <laughs> Not too romantic. <laughs> so, so Ted Deschler, who, I, who I've had the great pleasure of working with, you know, from the very beginning on all this, and I started looking at road cuts in Pennsylvania because it was really obvious that if we wanted to find new fossils uh, in you know, in the right time period for this fish to amphibian transition, a good cheap way to begin this was to look at the road cuts in Pennsylvania. And it turns out by the big, big mid-90s, Ted and I had uncovered a variety of, you know, road cuts that were producing uh, early tetrapods uh, and their fish-like relatives. So you'd, by you'd, about find, nine, you'd so find, sorry, you'd find like a, an arm bone here or a wrist bone there. Yeah. I mean, tell, what, what kind of yeah. things were you finding? Well, if we were really lucky, we'd find a shoulder bone, an arm bone, a jaw bone, mm -hmm. things like that, of a tetrapod, a, a, a limbed animal, of uh, which there are actually several types along the roads of Pennsylvania at this time. But also, you know, we'd find skeletons of fish, bits and pieces of them, sometimes a whole skeleton of some of the smaller fish. It, was, it turned out to be really um, 
productive. Mm-hmm. But by about 1998, Ted and I were sort of chomping into, chomping into bit for like a, a new kind of exposure. There were a couple problems with Pennsylvania. One is we were sort of at the end of the transition from fish to amphibian. We wanted to go earlier in time. If we really, you know, wanted to get at this transition, we needed something more, sort of more ancient towards the fish end of things. Mm-hmm. And then the other is we needed a place where we had we actually would have a better chance of finding whole uh, skeletons. Mm-hmm. Because in Pennsylvania, we got to the point where, you know, we were picking at the sides of these cliffs and these road cuts, and it's not a very satisfying way to work. <laughs> So Ted and I, be- so Ted and I began, a, you know, a search for a new place to work, mm-hmm. and we had lots of ideas. We were thinking of um, Alaska. We were thinking of um, parts of the American West. Um, and then one day, uh, we were sitting in my office at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was on the faculty at the time, and we were having a conversation, which turned into a debate or an argument. And one of us grabbed a book, a textbook, an undergraduate geology textbook, mm-hmm. and in that textbook was a figure which which was to change the course of our research for the next, you know, six to eight years. And it was a, a beautiful map. Um, and this map showed North America extending all the way to the Arctic. Mm-hmm. And it showed where Devonian age rocks uh, existed. Again, rocks of the right um, right age. And more importantly, this, this text showed um, where there were rocks that were formed in ancient streams and lakes and sort of more terrestrial kinds of things, not in the middle of the ocean. And it was really amazing to see this wonderful map, and and so it was, it was it was exciting because we saw the rocks in Pennsylvania mapped out beautifully, we saw rocks in Greenland mapped out beautifully, and these were important because these my colleague Jenny Clack and others uh, working in Greenland had discovered some early tetrapods there, and then um, there was another swath of rock across the Canadian Arctic, extending fifteen hundred kilometers from east to west. And it was mapped as Devonian age, mm-hmm. and in fact, earlier in time from the Catskill, than the Catskill. And uh, it was mapped as being produced in an ancient delta system. I mean, Ted and I were literally shaking when we, when we saw this for the first time, because we knew it was never really sort of prospected by paleontologists. Yet, at the surface at least, it had all the criteria that you'd kind of mm-hmm. want uh, as a paleontologist. It was, you know, rocks of the right age, and rocks of the right type. Mm-hmm. And, and even more importantly, in, in the Arctic, you know, there are no buildings, there's, you know, no trees or anything like that, so it, the rock had a good chance of being exposed to the surface. Yeah. So that excited us. What I found interesting when you're talking about that in the book, which I guess I really hadn't appreciated uh, when we had talked earlier um, about your discovery of it, was just sort of what a good example it is of how you actually have to make predictions, even in paleontology. You know, you have to say, okay, where am I going to look on the, on the planet? For these fossils, yep. you know, you're not you don't want to waste your your life looking in the wrong place. And so, you went to, I mean, you ended up going to this place which was the right age and the right ecology. You know, you knew that there were these four-legged vertebrates on land after this age. You knew that there were pretty much you know more sort of uh, primitive forerunners of of these tetrapods earlier than this. So this was the place to go to. Um, and exactly, and that's why our heart was racing when we saw this, really, because you know, it, by all those criteria you just <coughs> mentioned, this should be perfect. So Ted and I went to a Chinese went for lunch at a Chinese food restaurant after the um, uh, after this discovery of this site. It was in the morning, uh, and one of us had a fortune cookie which said, "Soon you will be at the top of the world." <laughs> you know, so it's like with that fortune cookie and this diagram, we. Uh, uh, we started our, uh, our our expedition, and this was in our first expedition to the Canadian Arctic was in uh, 1999. Uh, following some work of Canadian geologists who mapped the sites, we took a chance, and it turns out we plunked down in the wrong part of the Arctic. Uh, we spent a whole season, uh, in not only in bad weather, but when the weather cleared up, uh, it was actually it turned out to be the wrong kinds of rock. Mm-hmm. So we went back in 2000, we came a little closer, and went back a few more seasons, and it really wasn't until 2004, which was really designated as our last attempt at all this, uh, that you know the, we started to find what we were looking for. So you were almost ready to and pack it, it in and go home? Oh, we were definitely ready to pack it in. And um, In fact, other people were packing us in, our funders. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, it's not cheap working there, yeah. so um, we were... Uh, we were uh, we were at the end of our rope. So it was on the fourth day of our field season in July 2004. It's one of the most memorable uh, times of my entire paleontological career. Uh, we were working in a quarry where we had skeletons of fossil fish, 
and uh, we started to find these flat-headed fish. And I have, uh, so, fl- flat-headed fish, I mean, why is the flat-headed fish so important? Yeah, so if you look at the transition from fish to tetrapod, what you go from in the fish end is the fish have sort of a conical head with eyes on either side. Right? Like a, like a trout towards, or some bass or, bass whatever or something we're familiar like with. Exactly, and you go to the amphibian end of things and you start to get a more of a flat head, almost like a, a flat-headed salamander or crocodile even, which is a reptile, but still mm-hmm. you get the flatter head with eyes on either side. Um, and so we knew from the shape of the head it was either going to be you know, an amphibian tetrapod tetrapody kind of thing, or a fishy kind of thing. And this is what um, came out. This is Tiktaalik, a cast of Tiktaalik. Now, I'm blind um, so here, so, here, so you're you're showing you're showing the skull, right? I'm showing Excellent. a head of Tiktaalik, cool. a cast of All right. it. So I've seen it, And so. what you see here are the orbits. Flat head. Boom. That's what I'm showing a flat head to our, our, our viewing audience. Um, now, this is a little squash specimen, but it gives you a sense of what we were looking at. And when we were in the field... All we saw was the snout of this thing sticking out. Mm-hmm. But we knew enough from that snout that it was going to be a flat-headed animal. And boy, that was so exciting because, you know, uh, the, the, the head was sticking out of the rock. And so we knew inside the rock, if we had any luck at all, would be the rest of the skeleton. Mm. And so we started to remove that um, and to find the rest of the skeleton. It turns out more of it was there. And in the process, found three more skeletons of this creature. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so we were giddy with joy. It was just arguably some of the worst weather we ever had in the Arctic. Uh, an entire season where it virtually s- it snowed or rained on us virtually every mm. day. Yet, we were so happy because we knew we found something. We found what we were looking mm-hmm. for, but we didn't know what it was, right? Be- and, and so, the trick then became to get these things home. So, I yeah, should say, you didn't know what it was because you really didn't take that much of it out of the rock. You just saw there's a fossil in there and took the rock. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly what we do. And so we're taking home boulders with pieces of, you know, of interesting fossils sticking out. Mm. Of them. Because the idea is we get them back to the laboratory where some really skilled people, we're fortunate to have uh, Fred Mullison in, um, in Philadelphia and Bob Masick in Chicago, who are incredibly skilled at, paint, at, at removing the rock from the bone. And that took months and months and months. So we got this, these boulders home, um, and they were paired out over a series of months. And uh, that was just a remarkable uh, fall of 2004, winter of 2005, where you know every day going into the office was really exciting because I didn't know what more of Tiktaalik was being exposed. And you know, first it was the neck. You know, we saw this thing. Fish don't have necks, right? Amphibians do. Well, it turned out as the preparators prepared this thing out, not only did this thing have a flat head, it had a neck. But we knew it had fins, and so um, you know, those fins had to be. Um, uh, you know, are, were interesting because we wanted to get inside those fins mm-hmm. to see if they had any you know resemblance uh, to limbs, and then we started to see pieces of the fin bones come out. And you know, every day something new is emerging, and it was just really exciting. Ted Desser and I would be on the phone pretty much uh, three or four times a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was another piece of the story, and that is as this was happening, as we were uncovering Tiktaalik every day, as the preparators were doing it. And Ted and I were seeing it for the first time. The Dover trial was going on. Intelligent design. Right. We and, should. You know, we're we, thinking the whole time. We should uh, just stop and, and just for those who aren't familiar with it, there was um, there was a case going on where um, the uh, a school board had said in Pennsylvania that their science classes had to be read this statement that evolution, basically the same one was something like evolution is just a theory. And uh, if the students are curious about alternatives, they should read about intelligent design. And <clears throat> they were told to check out a, uh, some books that were in the library called The Pandas and People, sort of a creation science textbook. And um, and that was a great one because in Pan- Pandas and People actually said, you know, there's no example of the fish amphibian transition or something like that. Right. You know, and so and you're digging <laughs> digging up one of them while it's going on. Yeah. yeah. So, and it was a really remarkable time because you know we it, we were uncovering this thing and we were now getting surprises and those surprises were that you know Tiktaalik had had a, a shoulder elbow and wrist but it had a wrist of a configuration very much like an amphibian mm-hmm. yet it was embedded in a fin with thin webbing mm. now, I have the actual original oh. here I mean, so this is um, uh, you can't see it Carl but this is these are the original uh, thin bones of um, of Tiktaalik. And what I'll pull out here to show our audience is this is the um, this is the real humerus of an upper arm bone of Tiktaalik. It would fit on me where my upper arm is. Uh-huh. And it was remarkable when we looked at these bones, um, we saw that they had the uh, 
actual preserved joint surfaces for the elbow, where the radius and ulna would fit in. It had the preserved joint surfaces uh, for the equivalent wrist bones and so forth. So not only were we seeing the bones, but we're seeing the way that the joints articulated or fit together, which gave us a sense of how this thing... Uh, so we had a little uh, breakdown with the phones there, but we're back on. And um, so, um, so Neil, you were talking about um, these weird uh, sort of shoulders that these things had. So they're not really, they're not really like our shoulder with kind of no. a ball and socket. Um, no. They're just, uh, what are they doing? Well, I, well it, it's a very stable shoulder, you know, and so it's a shoulder that's built for stability. It's mm. a shoulder that's built to do a form of a push-up, but not rotate. So it's uh, it's highly buttressed. And so what you have is an animal that's placing a premium on doing one thing at the shoulder, and that is doing a, like a bench press motion or a push-up motion. So maybe um, to, to breathe air? Yeah. Get so up above it, the surface? It'd get up above the surface or push itself up on the bottom of the water or support itself in the shallows. But clearly this is an animal that's using its appendages to support the body under a gravitational load, you know, mm. which is a technical way of saying, you know, it's not swimming in the water, it's, it's supporting its body with its fins. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting is this is a, you know, this is a, a multi-purpose animal because all these sort of uh, support functions are set within a thing, an organ, which is truly a fin as well. You know, it has fin webbing. These bones we call lepidotrichia, you know, so... It's both a fin and has elements of a limb, and mm -hmm. and the and so and the elements of a limb it has are both um, derived in some ways, but also very primitive. Um, by derived, I mean very sort of odd, um, but um, but they're also very primitive amphibian-like features, like the mm -hmm. structures of uh, the muscle attachments to the humerus are really primitive. Yeah. Um, you know, the elbow is actually um, uh, is has a mixture of fish and amphibian characteristics. Mm -hmm. So. You know, so it's really this uh, sort of mosaic of primitive and, and more advanced things and set in the, in the fin. Mm -hmm. But what was, what was really cool is we could do some functional anatomy. You know, how did this thing work as an animal? Right. Um, you know, it had one of the first necks, or arguably the first neck in the fossil record, in, in, in a vertebrate. So it was mm -hmm. moving its head. Um, it lost the opercular bone, which is, uh, which is really a big, uh, big step. Um, it had massive ribs. Uh, and so now our goal really is to understand, you know, more about the variation of Tiktaalik. Mm -hmm. Tiktaalik is not one thing. We have a growth series. Like the smallest Tiktaalik is like uh, a couple inches long, and the biggest Tiktaalik is about, you know, twice that. Um, you know, so there's significant size variation. Um, we'd like to see if there's any anatomical variation among the Tiktaaliks there that we find, the different specimens of Tiktaalik we find. So far it doesn't okay. seem that way, but talk to me in a year. We'll see after this field season. Mm. Um, you know, we have a site which is continuing to produce um, tiktaalic, bones of tiktaalic. So we're uh -huh. going to return to that uh, and uh, and then go up in time to hopefully find, you know, more amphibian uh, tetrapod uh, kinds of things. Yeah, tiktaalic's just been really fun. It's just been, um, you know, it's been a remarkable uh, experience for me because I've, I've learned so much um, about not only the transition from fish, fish to amphibian, but, you know, there's also personal lessons you learn spending, you know, working in the Arctic, which is not easy. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's logistics, you know, how to get an expedition there and get everybody home safely, that kind of thing. And uh, I, I would think that you learned a bit about how the media works. I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, oh boy. you yeah. got hit pretty hard by the attention. I mean, had you had Yeah, any... I wasn't prepared for that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you think that, that you'd get anything like that? I mean, well, I thought, you know, we had two articles and two research articles in Nature, so I expected coverage. You know, that's, you know, that, that will get somebody's, you know, notice. Nature, nature is like the most prominent journal in the world, so. Yeah, it's a very yeah, prominent people journal. People will notice it. You know, and we had two prominent papers back to back, which they rarely do. We had the cover. Uh, you know, so it was going to get the full treatment, but, you know, I really didn't. I expected some news stories, maybe a feature or two, like we usually get. Um, and, you know, I remember this time of walking, you know, April 6, 2000, you know, uh, walking out, uh, you know, my apartment to get my New York Times and seeing, you know, Tiktaalik, you know, the right-hand side of the paper, two columns, picture of Tiktaalik on the front page, above the fold. Then I knew things were going to be a little crazy. Mm. And it was crazy <laughs> for a while there. Um, and what's so much interesting, I learned a lot of lessons about, you know, I took, there were certain aspects of Tiktaalik that were reported very well. There are parts of Tiktaalik, I think, that, that, that got misunderstood um, and that sort of got misreported to some extent. Um, 
I you know, learned a lot of lessons about how to communicate, how not to communicate, uh, you know, made some mistakes. Uh, you know, it was a real learning experience in a lot of ways. But, um, you know, but so for instance, with Tiktaalik, the things that got reported really well were you know, how we found it, uh, what it is described in the feature. I was very impressed by how people came to grips with that. Uh, journalists were able to come to grips with some of the subtle anatomy and so forth. You know, then there were pieces that I don't think were, you know, that, that I, I winced when I saw them. You know, the use of the term missing link uh, was so, used a lot. So explain why you don't like uh, the term missing link. I mean, I I don't like it either, but, uh, you know, you, you're the scientist, so what what gets you about it? Yeah, where do I begin? <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, a couple things. I mean, the first is, it's like the way it was often recorded was like, here's evidence for evolution that scientists found. Well, you know, I didn't go to the Arctic to find evidence for, you know, evolution. Um, you know, nor did I go to the Arctic to find evidence for the amphibian, you know, the fish relationships of amphibians. You know, so it's not like we were waiting for the discovery of Tiktaalik to, you know, confirm anything along those lines. We, um, we should but, say that, that there was there are all these other fossils and, oh, yeah. and all these other similarities that you talk about in your book um, that, that sort of lay the groundwork for... for your, yeah. for finding Tiktaalik. Oh, yeah, we didn't find Tiktaalik in a vacuum, and it doesn't exist in a vacuum. We, uh, Tiktaalik only makes sense in comparison to all the other great fossils that have been known for a long time. Um, now, Tiktaalik is a wonderful example, arguably the best example, because it's at the right time period, we have multiple specimens, it's very well preserved, but it doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's some wonderful fossils out there, both in the amphibian side and on the fish side. But more importantly, there's a more subtle and yet more important um, uh, a problem with the missing link concept, and that is the notion that we're you know we're, we're always trying to find deep ancestors that you know there's this continu- continuity of ancestors that paleontologists are trying to to discover, and I try to dispel that in the book, and, and the the example I used in the book and is the one that I use in my teaching and and describing things to, to friends and family and so forth who aren't scientists is you know imagine what we're trying to do with think discovering things like Tiktaalik, uh, and what we're trying to do. Uh, when uh, when we um, when we do molecular evolution studies, is understand the family tree of relatedness. We're trying to understand how close and far away species or groups are from one another. And the best analogy for that is imagine if I um, you know dropped off in any random cemetery uh, in, on the planet, and mm-hmm. you know and uh, and I had a DNA kit where I could uh, look at the relationships of those people buried in that cemetery to me. What would I find? I'd find a whole cemetery of cousins. Some of them would be really distant from me, and some of them would be not so really distant to me, maybe closer. I'd find a family tree of relatedness. Mm. It would take an extraordinary piece of luck, and in fact, almost impossible, for me to randomly hit on an ancestor of mine. Mm -hmm. Well, the fossil choir we have in, um, where we find the fossils in in the Arctic, think of it as a cemetery. What I'm doing is I'm finding lots of different types of fish and other kinds of creatures, and they're all related to me to different degrees. What I'm trying to do is find out who's closer and farther. I'm trying mm-hmm. to find different degrees of cousins, if you will, not ancestors. Mm-hmm. There's a long way of saying is that what we have had for a long time in this study of paleontology is lots of really great cousins of amphibians. Mm-hmm. Um, and what Tiktaalik is, it's not a missing link per se. It's just a new cousin that's actually closer related to us than some of these other ones and better preserved. But mm-hmm. it's not a missing link that you know we've been waiting for to confirm our scientific theories. Not at all. It's just a closer related version of what we've had before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's provided new anatomical details, which are giving us new windows on how the transition from fish to amphibian happened. Yeah, I was really, um, uh, well, I guess I was a little depressed when I saw there were these reports about um, whales and the origin of whales. Um, and the, it's kind of a parallel thing. I mean, actually, in, in At the Water's Edge, I kind of made that parallel where you have animals going back in the water. And so just, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I guess, uh, some people were identifying um, this little mammal about uh, 48 million years old, kind of looks like a little tiny little deer or something that they're saying is, is the, the closest relative to the whales. Now, people have found a whole bunch of um, walking whales before from around that same age, but they were more like living whales than this critter was. Um, and it was... I don't know. It was just it was disappointing that you you actually saw reporters claiming that this was uh, the ancestor the of ancestor. whales. Yeah, Even I it was actually younger. Ancestor. It was it was younger than some of the old, uh, oldest walking whales. And it, it just missed the point. 
exactly. um, that uh, it's just it's this branch that's outside of this group of branches. Right, and it's relatedness we're after, degrees yeah. of cousinness, if you will, and that's hard to get across often. And and that and so in, in, just like <coughs> in your example with the whales, Tiktaalik was given that same sort of the ancestor treatment or the missing mm-hmm. link treatment. You know, and I think that missed the beauty of the story, actually. I mean, misses, mm-hmm. it misses, actually, when we describe it that way, what I'm actually trying to accomplish as a scientist. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to understand relatedness and what it means uh, mm-hmm. for evolution, not yeah. as much, you know, trying to find the missing link, if you will. I mean, I'm trying mm-hmm. to, you know, um, certainly I want to understand closer and closer relatives to tetrapods uh, or, you know, go work down the tetrapod tree and find closer and closer versions of fish, but... You know, it's a subtly different sort of thing. So the, um, but you know, I also saw other parts of the media. You know, the blogosphere picked up on the TikTok very nicely, and you know, so oh, yeah. you know, there's a fact-checking property to the blogosphere that's that's really wonderful. Um, mm. the, you know, you get people in the know responding, you get the common exchange. There's an immediacy to it. So, you know, I think in the end of the day, I mean, uh, you know, there were some. Uh, TikTok was covered very well in some ways, not well in the others, and then the blogosphere mm-hmm. picked up with certain. You know, fact checking or error correcting kinds of discussions. You know, yeah. It is what it well, is. you know, it's interesting. Your book now is coming out um, at, at another. It's another interesting time in a way because, um, you know, this this there was this Nova show uh, about the Dover case we were just talking about, and you're in it because they're kind of doing this parallel between what you're off doing in the field, finding this evidence of how life came on land, and then. Uh, cutting back to this trial, so that that was interesting. And then um, I don't know. It just seems like there's a lot of um, sort of the political controversy of evolution in the news these days. I mean, I just got this thing I got here. I'm going to hold up from the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine called Science, Evolution, and Creationism. That just came out. And I, actually, just before we started talking, I came across this thing from. Uh, a, a big report, I don't know if you'd seen it, Neil, from this coalition of scientific societies um, no. talking about how, how scientists have to do a better job of teaching evolution. And I'm looking at this list here, and it's, it's all sorts of societies. Like you've got, um, well, you've got the biologists, but then you have the Astronomical Society and the American Physical Society. And, and so it seems like, you know, the scientists are definitely... Um, uh, Getting very active, certainly more active than I remember when I started writing about this stuff. So your book comes out in an interesting time. Well, the book was like my way of describing what I do to a non-scientist. And the non-scientist I had in my head when I wrote the book was my father, who, you know, college educated, but, you know, never really, uh, you know, always had science phobia to some extent. Hmm. Uh, the complexities of science are, scared him. And so, you know, it was, it's a very personal experience, as you well know, writing, particularly writing a book. Mm-hmm. And, and the personal bit of this was, I was actually, it was a monologue to my dad. And, you know, how do I describe what I do to him? Hmm. And, um, you know, how do I make it sensible, um, interesting, compelling? Um, and part of the, the, what I wanted to communicate in the book was not only the facts of what I do, but also why I do it, why I enjoy getting, you know, most days I enjoy going to work. You know, some days I don't, but most days I do. And, you know, why, you know, and, you know, why was that? Why do I like it? That kind of thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, so there was a lot of personal things that get into that, the motivations to do that. And then not the least of which is, of course, you know, frustration with uh, uh, creationism, intelligent design, science education. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, been much more involved with my you know, schools, particularly my son's school. Um, being involved with the museum, uh, the Field Museum in Chicago, has given me a lot of experience in dealing with the general public. And... and um, and, and, and those are, are good experiences because it, it's, it gets you out of the box of being a scientist just in your lab. I mean, mm. how do you communicate what you do? And, and um, we're so used to talking to each other with our own conventions and jargon yeah. and so forth. You know, and I try to pop out of that. And, you know, uh, you make mistakes when you do these things, but you, um, but, I, you know, it was, it was a great experience all the way around um, doing the book and communicating with the museum and so forth. Yeah, it used to be that a lot of scientists I would talk to, if I, especially biologists, if I would bring up these sorts of issues, they would get downright uncomfortable, just feeling like, well, it's, I, you know, I don't really, I, I'm just, I'm just a scientist, and I, I just want to go, I just really want to go out on the tundra and find some more fossils, and I don't want to think well, about. Part of me is like that. <laughs> I love just going out on the tundra and finding fossils. Like what I'm, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but you know, I exist in a, in a society. I exist in a matrix, of, and, and you know, it just becomes so clear when you see. 
uh, you know, a large percentage of Americans, uh, you know, believe the biblical story of creation over uh, over Darwinian evolution, and you know, that's uh, we have our work cut out for us, and mm. uh, and that's a surprising disconnect because we're at a time where it's not just fossils, where we have wonderful fossil discoveries telling us about how evolution works, but you know, we have the birth of genomics and the whole field of developmental evolutionary biology, and you know, all kinds of new wonderful data coming in to tell us about the interrelationships of species, how organs evolve, and so forth. Right. Well, okay. So, does that mean that you scientists are doing something wrong? I mean, are you not doing the job you should be doing? I think to some extent, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, to some extent, yeah, we are because um, we talk to each other, uh, and we're very good at that. Um, we write grants. We are able to frame our discoveries in a way that other people, our colleagues, can understand. But getting the word out about the basics of what we do and why it's important um, and what the larger context of our discoveries are, for instance, the missing link and relatedness issue, I mean, I think we have to be out, out in point on that. Now, we are in an age where the blogosphere is becoming much more important in science education. I think, you know, if you look at scienceblogs.com and the number of blogs, including your own and Ferengula and, and others there, I mean, I think you're seeing scientists becoming much more, um, and journalists becoming much more involved in communicating. Uh, and it's the beautiful thing about that is it has a much more real time aspect to it. You know, paper appears in a journal, and boom, there's a conversation about it. You know, right. um, which has a, a nice. But my worry is, and, and I think the blogosphere is great, but we're you know, all the scienceblogs.com might have I don't know how many hits it has. Maybe it's called half a million. It's called even a million uh, a day, uh, not hits, visits a day. Um, yeah, you know, you're on blogging head, You're on blogging heads now, Neil, and, and you're going to conquer the world with this. <laughs> but you know, we still have a large fraction of the population that is mm. scared of science, that doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't understand the basics of science. Mm. Um, you know, I know this from you know when I talk to leaders of uh, the Field Museum or other places where you know they these are people who are very plugged into uh, uh, reading nonfiction and so forth. But the science sometimes is um, you know it's, it has a different. Uh, a different feel to it, and I think we have to do a better job of, of, of communicating. And so, to get back to answer your question, uh, yes, I think we need to do a better job of it. And um, and um, and I, you know, I did my bit. I mean, I'm doing my bit with the book. That was what I tried to do. That was motivated. But you know, there's still a whole lot more we can do. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I uh, one thing I found interesting in the book um, was the the link you made um, between Tiktaalik. And, and lots of other uh, interesting animals and, and our own anatomy. I mean, you, in, in a sense, you are an anatomist. Um, and, yeah. you know, there's this, um, it, it sort of reminded me about how, you know, there's, there's this grand tradition of anatomy, you know, in, in the history of science. I mean, it used to be that the anatomists were, you know, the, 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 the loftiest natural philosophers in the Middle Ages. I, I, I love those pictures where the, it would be the anatomists at medical school, who would stand up, be sitting in this throne, like way up high in a, in a theater, in the center, you know, gesturing, you know. Um, yeah, and the guy who, the guy whose job it was to cut open the cadaver for him was the surgeon. You know, that's been you know back when surgeons had to do the dirty work. Um, but um, but it's it's interesting that there's still this connection. I mean, you you know, you still oh, teach much. human anatomy. Um, you know, so you, you're you're digging up fossils and you're 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 showing uh, medical students how the human body's put together. Well, the so, book Your Inner Fish was born that way because, you know, I was teaching human anatomy. I was the director of the course, you know, and uh, for medical students. And we're dissecting cadavers, you know, and then we discovered Tiktaalik, you know, in the summer. And, you know, it's like, wait a minute. You know, there's a story here about, you know, our body is uh, connected to other creatures, fish, worms, and so forth. And it's not just mm -hmm. embedded in our bones but in our DNA, so. Um, yeah, I mean, so, like, what's a, I mean, what's something that, you know, we can look at in our own body that's you know kind of a, a a a mark of this this evolutionary history. I mean, what's an example you like? Well, for in the fish amphibian transition, and Tiktaalik is the first neck. So next time you move your head from side to side, you can thank Tiktaalik for that. Uh, <laughs> fish beforehand had a you know a, a head that was connected to the shoulder. Uh, amphibians don't. And Tiktaalik actually has the sort of a primitive version of the amphibian condition. Think of uh, the bones that I'm using to talk to you right now. They were originally gill bones in a shark. The bones uh, that you're using to hear me with uh, um, uh, were originally gill bones in a shark. We can trace these things through fossils, we can trace them through embryos, and we can trace them through DNA. 
Mm. Um, you know, so you we see bits and pieces of us. And what, what I love is if you look inside our ears, we have three little bones, right? Malleus, incus, and stapes. Um, those three little bones uh, have a wonderful evolutionary history. Um, they originally uh, pieces of jaw or gills. And if you trace the evolutionary history of our ear bones, two of them relate to the transition from reptile to mammal. Uh, mm-hmm. Another one of them relates from the transition from fish to amphibian. So you have a, like a whole part of the tree of life embedded in our ears. Mm. Uh, if you look at the genes that we use um, that encode uh, the receptors for olfactions, you know, smell, various smells, there's a tree of life embedded in those. I mean, you can see a little mini tree of life in all parts of our body. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once mm-hmm. you see yourself in this way, it sort of changes your worldview to some extent. And, and we uh, scientists are used to thinking this way. But you know, mm-hmm. it's actually a big leap for someone who doesn't think that way to, to begin to see themselves not only as connected to the rest of life, but as but having a whole tree of life embedded inside them. You know, so. Now, I mean, I'm wondering if I can um, get you to talk a little bit about hernias um, <laughs> because I just I, I I've had one. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. Thank goodness. But uh, but you talked about hernias in the book, and I thought this was like such a. Well, I, I mean, I didn't. It just totally took me by surprise. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't know that that uh, it has something to do with where the testicles and a shark are, and and yeah, exactly, <laughs> and and it also that it really shows you how um, kind of jury rigged our bodies is. I mean, that we have to like, put up with these these built in flaws. I mean, maybe you can just sort of just describe that that transformation that le- leaves us prone to hernias. Sure. And so, um, if you look at a male. Um, you know, we have, we have scrotums, and the scrotum contains the testes. And the reason why is because it's a temperature control mechanism for sperm. Sperm, are fairly, sperm production is fairly finicky. It requires a very delicate, you know, window of, of temperatures. And so, so just, have just, a, for, just for mammals, right? Yeah, it's for mammals, exactly. Right. Yeah. And so you have, and, um, and so the, um, it turns out, though, that the testes, which are in the scrotum in adult males now, didn't start their development there. They actually start the development higher up in the body, much closer to the chest. So when you look at growth of a human male, they begin with the testes up towards the chest, and the testes actually descend in the body relatively to other structures, right? And eventually, what becomes the scrotum is actually an out, it's a part of the body wall that's pushed out, okay, uh, to contain the, uh, the testes. So not only do the testes descend from chest to scrotum where they are now, but that sac, the scrotum, and the contents in it is actually an out pocket of the entire body wall. Um, that doesn't really work well in a biped because <laughs> what that means is if you think about a, a male walking around, what you have is an out pocket near the body wall that has the spermatic cord in it, but as you go towards the abdomen, you have all the guts there. So, and you know, those guts are under pressure, particularly when you sneeze, laugh, cough, lift weights, and so forth. So, mm-hmm. if there's a weakness in that area, or if there's a problem in the descent of the testes, you mm-hmm. can get pieces of the gut or pieces of the abdominal contents actually extending in that out pocket towards the scrotum. That's a hernia or an inguinal mm-hmm. hernia. Um, and you can ask, why do that? That's such a jerry rigged mechanism. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever until you start to look at sharks or fish. And the primitive condition is actually if you were to cut open a shark, what you find is the testes, like a human embryo, are actually up much more towards the chest. So we have this evolutionary history of the so, early so, so the shark in the sharks they 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 develop up in the chest area and they and they stay there. Well, they don't have a chest. Right, sharks don't really have a chest, but they high right. up, you know, from right. the cloaca, you know, towards the heart. They're closer to the uh-huh. heart. And, right. Um, and yeah, and, and they stay there. They don't descend. Mm-hmm. And see, in mammals, they have to descend because if our testes were in our um, uh, were higher up in our chest, you know, in our abdomen, it's too hot for testes. You know, uh-huh. for, for sperm production, there's, there's certain biophysical constraints to this process. Mm-hmm. So to get around these constraints, we've created this sac, the scrotum, but in the process, uh, we've created a zone of weakness that exists in males, less so in females. Mm-hmm. Females, actually, they're, they're, te- they're gonads descend as well. The ovaries actually descend also. But mm-hmm. they don't since they don't have a spermatic cord or a, or a scrotum, they don't have the same level of weakness of the body wall as males. So the, the female abdomen in that area, or inguinal area, is actually stronger than males. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's largely because of this descent. 
um, which is a remarkable example of how our bodies are jerry rigged, just sort of cobbled together. That we're, you know, much of us has been repackaged, repurposed, modified in other ways from other animals that existed, from our from our ancestors, from our closest yeah. relatives, and so forth. And, you know, that's a great example of it. Now, like as if um, as if you weren't busy enough. I mean, there's this whole other side to the work you do, and I, I mean, if if I, I, I've gone to, into your lab, and I mean, when you come in there. Uh, you might not guess if you didn't know it that that Neil is a uh, paleontologist because there are all these grad students and postdocs running around looking at embryos and and it, looking at slides and trying to fit of them and trying to figure out what genes are switching on and off. It's a really wet lab, um, and, there, and uh, so this is this whole other side of your work. And I mean, I think the people who are, aren't familiar with the research, they might think that you're a bit schizophrenic. Um, so what you know? Why are you doing all that? Yeah, it's, it's it's really two sides of the same work, really. I mean, so I'm interested in how anatomy evolves, mm-hmm. how do new structures come to being, and so and I'm interested fundamentally in providing new data that tells us how all this stuff happened, you know. Mm-hmm. And for that, there's really kind of the paleontology is 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 essential. It really provides the 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 the, the evidence for how transitions happened in the past, but also in, essential and increasingly important is the window that genetics development and embryos and genetics and embryos give us to understand how the recipes that build bodies evolved. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not just that our organs have a history, it's the recipes that build those organs or build our bodies has a history. And that's the fundamental history because that's what's inherited. And so in my laboratory, we sort of look at the same question but in different ways. So I'm interested in the transition from fish fins to tetrapod limbs. One piece of that story is discovering creatures like Tiktaalik or Cerypterus or other things we've done. Um, but then, you know, there's another piece of this, which is really understanding how the genes that build limbs, what is their history? And for that, we have to look at uh, fish, um, sharks, uh, skates and rays is a big example for us. Um, and it's a very powerful window because we can begin to see what's the same and what's different in the recipe that builds a, a fin and a limb. And there are a couple surprises there. You know, one of those surprises is there's a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, um, the major regulatory genes, that is the genes that actually, uh, that pizza bits of DNA that actually form fundamental bits of that instructional code that builds uh, organs, is, is very much the same in many different kinds of animals and many different kinds of appendages, whether it's fin or limbs. What's different so, is how... So you've got, so you've got the, a fin, like in a shark. I mean, if you look at a, the fin of a shark and look at your own hand, I mean, they, they look really different, obviously. And, they really uh, do. And, and yet you're, you're saying that a lot of the same switches that are turning genes on and off are, are the same? Yeah, and you always remember, so like, you think about your hand, right? You have five fingers, hopefully, and you, know, you have a pinky and a thumb, and... And the pinky th- side and the thumb side look different from one another. Mm-hmm. And one thing mm-hmm. we've known from genetic research over the past um, decade or so is that there are a number of bits of DNA that are very active in making the pinky side of our limbs, our hands and feet, different from the, 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 the thumb side. You know, mm-hmm. And so then you look at a shark fin, right? Very different. They've been separated for hundreds of millions of years, sharks and humans. Um, you know, but you look at the genes and look at the gene that makes the one side of the fin different from another side of the fin in a shark, and guess what? It's the same bit of DNA deployed in very much the same way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's these fundamental bits of the toolkit or recipe that builds bodies that's that's very much the same in different animals. And what you see is when you see the body in this way, you see animals as sort of variations on a theme that is you're tweaking a fundamental recipe mm-hmm. and itself is highly conserved. But, and those tweaks become highly important to understand evolution because they're mm-hmm. the ones that produce variation and so forth. So, so even though you don't see, you know, you don't see hands and feet 400 million years ago, it's not like they just popped out of nowhere. They're they're sort of building. They're they're, they're emerging from these tweaks to this this network you're talking about. Exactly, and you know that's. That's such a beautiful window because that's not a window that necessarily fossils would give us, you know. It's and this is mm-hmm. something that, you know, and we're able to do experiments on these embryos in ways that we can never think, dream about doing on, on fossils. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, but this part, this part of the research is incredibly powerful, um, but it's also um, very, very, very difficult. I mean, so to do this kind of thing, what you need to bring into the laboratory is the kinds of 
animals that most people don't do research on. You know, there's not a lot of people doing work on skates uh, or or um, or paddlefish or sturgeons, and and there's a reason why. Is these are all difficult to work with in a number of, of ways. And so, well, when you say work with, I mean, you're talking about. I mean, you've got to like, what are you doing? Are you like getting an egg and getting it to hatch, and then yeah. looking at the embryo? Yeah. So first, you got to get the eggs. That's some for some of these things. So for some of them, it's easy. For others, it's hard. Depends on the mm-hmm. species. Then you have to learn how to raise the eggs so they don't die, and you have to get them, get them to the right stages where they're developing their appendages, and that you have to learn by doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have to figure out, you know, how do you get the molecular biology to work on these things? How do you have to pull out the genes, the deep bits of DNA in these new species? That's mm-hmm. not trivial. Then you have to learn how to work with those embryos and do experiments, and even trivial things like how you work with a skate egg versus mm-hmm. a chicken egg. I mean, there are differences. If yeah. at certain stages, if you put a little hole in a skate egg, the whole embryo will pop out of it and die. And so, you know, you have to design all these fixes and, and things like that. And that's what the postdocs and graduate students get very good at very quickly. <laughs> do, you, do you find that, um, I mean, do you, how often do you find that uh, what you're seeing in the embryos, what you're learning, helps you to understand what you're seeing in the fossils? It actually works both ways, yeah. And so um, the, um, let me give you the opposite. There is a uh. case where we found this one fossil called Cerypterus. Okay. where it had a very unique morphology. It gave us a whole new question to ask about embryos. Um, uh, and, and so that really gave me a new way. That fossil gave me a new way of looking at the embryos of basal actinopterygians, so those mm-hmm. ra- primitive ray finned fish. Um, there are times when the fossil, when the embryos will affect how I look at the fossils. So, for instance, mm-hmm. one of the postdocs in the laboratory uh, last year described um, how... Um, Primitive fish actually have the, the the genetic recipe, if you will, that we previously thought was only used to build fingers, mm-hmm. um, and it showed that the recipe to make fingers uh, was around for a long time before fingers actually were seen in the fossil record, mm-hmm. um, which actually answered a bit of a puzzle for us because we were finding in Tiktaalik pieces of the palm and pieces of the wrist and so forth. It was showing that fingers evolved prior to tetrapods or at least the, the wrist area and parts distal or away from the, the shoulder developed in tetrapods. So there are mm-hmm. cases where these pieces of data fit together. Now, there are p- cases where there's a large disconnect, um, and, and that's because of the kinds of data that we collect. Um, so, for instance, there's nothing like Tiktaalik alive on the Earth today. What I'd love to know mm-hmm. is how Tiktaalik developed its, its fins, but I can never really learn that. I can only sort of approximate or, or triangulate that by... Looking at fish that are closely related to, you know, to, to lobe fin fish, if you will, mm-hmm. and see what's going on, which is mm-hmm. tectonic to form a lobe fin fish. So I have to sort of mm-hmm. approximate these things in some ways. So yes, there are cases where my thinking's been changed by embryos, and there are cases where my thinking's been changed by fossils. Um, yeah. And that's the beauty of doing both, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what really strikes me um, about this kind of research that you're talking about is that, I mean, when I was writing At the Water's Edge, um, you and a few other people were were going down this road, uh, particularly with looking at, at these embryos um, and trying to get these these clues about ancient evolutionary events from them. Uh, and you know, since then, uh, this field—I mean, we could call it Evo Devo—has just um, exploded. And it's not just fish. Um, there's people doing great work on, on insects, you know, how insects got all their legs and their wings and such. There, there's, it's all over the place. Bat wings, how did bat wings evolve from Jellyfish the and sea anemones yeah. and sponges. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's amazing how it's exploded. Yeah, and, and um, so, I mean, is it, um, I mean, how much, I'm always curious with these things. I mean, how much uh, do you think is, like, um, well, what kind of a feature do you think Evo Devo has? I mean, uh, is this is? I mean, some people are claiming this is like the the, the final part in in the grand synthesis of evolution that biologists have been trying to to achieve. Um, and then other people say, other scientists are saying, hey, hey, whoa, slow down here. This is this is not such a big deal. We're just figuring out. You know how embryos are built, and it just is kind of you know, the same kind of. Combination of mutation and natural selection we were talking about before. Let's 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 cool down and you know 
breathe deeply. Um, I mean, where do you fall down in, in, in the spectrum? Um, I fall down in sort of rational exuberance. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, think, <laughs> um, I think, you know, is it, is, it, um, is it revolutionary to the extent that it's giving us a new understanding about how bodies are built, how ge- the relationship between what we call the genotype or the genes and the body, the phenotype? Absolutely. Has that been a holy grail? Of, uh, of evolutionary research for the past 50 years? Absolutely. Um, is it going to provide us with a whole new mechanism of evolution, um, you know, other than natural selection? Uh, probably not. Um, you know, so, yes, it's, it's giving us access to, to questions and data and debates and answers to debates that have existed for a long time. You know, but is it the end of research? I mean, is it the end of history, that kind of thing? I mean, uh, no. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're going to be, we're living in an age where there's like a revolution every two years, you know, mm. from, you know, from genomics to RNAi, which was, you know, the Nobel Prize in 2006, which was from work from like, you know, eight years before. I mean, the, the pace of change is so fast that, you know, I, uh, I think, you know, it depends how you want to define Devo Evo, but if you, you fold in genomics and, and informatics and uh, and so forth. I think we're um, uh, we're making some dramatic discoveries. But is this the end of research as we know it? Are we going to answer all the questions and then move on? I, obviously not. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'd be out of business. You know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be out of business. All right. Well, um, I I think uh, I think that's uh, I think that's our time. So. Um, you know, the next time you uh, next time you dig up something incredible, let's uh, <laughs> let's get on blogging ads again, and you can show off the new bones. How about that? All right, thanks a lot, Carl. This has been fun. All right, cool. All right, so we're gonna sign off now. All right, take care.